Hello. This is yet another meeting of the visual tools group where we are looking into some of the, of the emerging closure tools for data visualization and literate programming and such. And uh, today here we are, um, uh, Jack and Lucas and Maurizio and Daniel, and we'll hear a talk by Maurizio about a new attempt to build a new editor completely in closure extensible and and modular and inspired by, by atom and probably we'll hear more about it in a moment uh, so hello Maurizio okay hello um okay I'm sure I'm gonna share my screen right now so uh this is I, I like the way that you describe it as an attempt because that's exactly what I'm doing and that's a, how I wanted to to phrase this it's for now an attempt only I'm not sure how far I can go into this project, especially alone, but um, well, the idea is make a hackable text editor using most of the Atom that I can and see if it works. I mean, um, it's a big work. So I would like to start this presentation with some facts about the planet, not the project yet. So the first thing that you have to know that Saturn, it's huge. The planet is huge. Well, probably most people know that. But in the terms of the editor, it means that I don't want to build it all at once. I want, we want to be able to build the whole editor from scratch in a single moment, in a single step, because it's huge. And the second fact about Saturn is that we don't know if there's a rocky core or not. People say that's mostly bound by gravity and they that the planet transitions from gas to less gas to more dense to more dense and we don't know if there's a rocky core or not so this translates to the plugin that users that are using the, the editor they should not be able to tell the difference be between if it's a core or if it's a plugin so that's one of the things that I meant when I said, I don't want to build the whole editor at once. Maybe we can build plugins and then enrich the editor little by little with plugins and not really with the, I don't know, making a core that's really big and then build from there. So Saturn floats on water. That's an interesting fact. Saturn is a huge planet, but it's less dense. So, <laughs> The, translating to that, it means that I want this code base to be less dense than other editors. If you look at the VS Code editor, especially VS Code or the Atom code base, it's huge. It's like huge, complicated with lots of uh, branches of, okay, so I'm running in this, in this situation, what do I do? And I want the code that we do to be less than so people can look at the code and understand what's happening. And you don't need to like, I don't know, do well, the whole enterprise code, like we have a presenter and a provider and, a, and something, something, something to go to where you want. I want the code to be more right to the point. And oh, of course, Saturn can host life as we know it. And we will also not be able to host our life if we decide, decide to create an editor from scratch. But maybe it can host life on, on at least one of its moons. And that means that maybe we can use the plugins and the idea of like hosting things outside of the Saturn itself so we can have a life while you, we build the editor. So that's the core idea about the planet and the project again. So, okay, why did I choose Atom? That's one of the questions that I mostly get sometimes. So people say, okay, we have code mirror, we have like VS Code, that's the, I think probably today VS Code is what most people use. And we have also Light Table that is already an editor that's written in Clojure Script. So maybe we could reuse that. But Atom is the only one that have reusable ish components. It's not 100% reusable as I wanted, but we can do something that it's reusable. And so we don't need to invent everything from scratch. Lighttable 
is interesting, but they have a structure that's called BOT, behavior, objects, and triggers, if I'm not mistaken. And it's not easily explained in anywhere. So the author decided to do this structure. Maybe it's a good idea, maybe it's not, but he didn't document exactly what it means. So you kind of have guesswork on how light table works. So it's hard to like understand how light table should be maintained. Atom is also highly hackable, more than VS Code and other VS Visual Editors, maybe less than VIM, but it's almost in the same level, and less than Emacs, because Emacs is like a beast. It's basically a list machine all the way down. So we can never get to uh, Emacs level unless we don't compile anything and allow everything to be changeable in some way. I'm not sure if we can do that. And Atom have a good plugin system that still works today. It's a little dated, but it works. And I'm gonna show a little bit more in a minute. And it's also possible to implement a VS Code API over the Atom API because it's way more flexible than the VS Code. So in theory, we could have VS Code plugins running in Atom. So why not Atom? Because I mean, if I'm, I'm not only saying good things about Atom, so why don't I reuse Atom like 100%, just keep maintaining it? And I did try, but there's a lot of not invented here things. Maybe it's because they decided to start the editor in a moment that Electron didn't exist and everything else, but there are lots of not invented here. It means like they did not use a package that already exists, they invented their own. So to keep Atom also means keeping at least 17 packages that Atom uses internally. So it's a huge work to make it work. And if you're familiar with NPM, you know that NPM is a pain to use because it breaks lots of things. So NPM install, right now it's failing. So you have to keep trying, trying, trying until it works. Actually, I was not able to make NPM work I use a yarn, and after I think five tries without changing a single line of code, it finally was able to install anything. So I do not want this experience in an editor. Like you want to hack the editor, I'm just like, okay, just install yarn and like keep running yarn install until it works. It's like nonsense. And upgrading node break things, downgrade also breaks. Building instructions are not working. It's not now, it's not working. So you have to kind of hike around your way. And there's lots of branching in Atom. They decided to do what they call bootstrap deer and config directory and dev mode. So there are lots of, if, if I am in config mode or in bootstrap mode or in development mode, do this thing differently. So I don't want to keep this level of interaction in my code. And well, of course, binary packages, Electron 90, core plugins use internal data from Atom. There are a lot of undocumented things that Atom does that I was not able to upgrade any package because it, lots of things simply do not exist anymore in Electron 12 and we are at Electron 18. So. I can't version bump that far with all this internal data. So I decided to try and see if I can do the hackable text editor. And I decided some principles. So first is nothing is sacred. It means that everything should be plugin, not even the part that edits text. So I should be able to reuse some, I don't know, code mirror or Monaco or the Atom editor itself to edit text, or I can just remove the edit text function completely. This will probably break the editor, but that's actually the point. Nothing is sacred. You can break the editor. It's not like VS Code safe. It's like Emacs safe. You install a misbehaving plugin, you break your editor, and well, good luck. Well, not exactly good luck. Then you have to say what the packaging should work, should be back to work. So also means that we should be able to extend it easily with plugins or scripts. And the third point is my main point. I want people to just use NPM install 
watch things and then everything starts to work. I do not want people to want to install Python 3 and then GCC and build tools and the go Clojurically and Lion and Boot, Babashka, NPB. Well, that's the whole point. I mean, it's less dense. You just install things and then start to hack and everything should work. And well, the idea, we should always have a default component for most people to use. It can also mean that this car component is less performant, but I want a trade-off. Like I can use a default component and a highly optimized component, but I want to keep work. I want to guarantee that the editor works at least with the most easy to keep component. So for example, the, a good example for this is File Watcher. Modern editors, when you change files outside of the editor, they are able to update the editor if you not, did not change anything. So supposedly I am editing a closure file and then I edit outside of it. I can see that the editor will reflect or at least inform me, okay, you change this file outside of your editor. What do you want to do? Discard your data, use the new data and so on and so forth. And if we could use like some kind of file watcher that uses polling and this is written in Rust that's compiled to WebAssembly, it means that we don't have to build binary packages for a specific, I don't know, Linux and Windows and Mac. So it should be easier to maintain this version than one that I should have a Mac, a Windows and a Linux and test if it's working on every version. So it's always the best to have something that we can work and can deliver fast and then be able to replace that with plugins because well, that's how I want, that's what I meant by less dense than Atom. And five, the 50 point is like, we should use libraries that already exist. It means do not invent something if it did not exist. It also means do not use the JavaScript word that's like, okay, I want a left pad. I'm gonna npm install left pad. No, if you need something that it's like complicated, for example, file watchers or I don't know, encoding translator, we should use libraries that exist. If this did not, if this these libraries don't exist, or if they are really small, we just copy paste our code inside the editor. It's better than like death by specificity that happened with Atom when you npm install and like lots of packages simply then do not install because they are outdated or they don't exist anymore. So problems. We should support plugins that already exist in Atom and VS Code especially in VS Code, but as the VS Code API can be implemented in the Atom API, maybe it's better to support the Atom API first, but especially a VS Code because there are more plugins for VS Code and for Atom. So that's one of the most important reasons. Again, why? Because nobody will use your editor if you don't have like Parinfer, Paradit, and Calva or Chlorine, or I don't know, any other package working. And that's one of the points, I mean, uh, I don't want to invent everything from scratch, but I also want people to use the, the editor that I'm doing. And the second point is that these plugins are JavaScript or TypeScript or anything. So there are lots of things that we can't reuse, we can't use in Clojure world. Mali schemas, reframe, Python, Eden. We can use this to develop our editor, but we can't expose this to plugins because they will not work. I'm not sure if uh, there are people that are not aware of that, but Clojure is a plugin, it's a package or library for the Java virtual machine, but Clojure script is not. Clojure script is a compiler. So you can't like expose Eden for plugins because these Edens are compiled to JavaScript and they lose meaning when you compile them. So you could, expose an SCI version, and that's maybe something that we can work on in the future, but SCI, SCI is slower than compiled JavaScript. So, and also if we decide only for SCI, we lose all the plugins that already exist for Atom and VS Code. And that's something that I don't want to, 
to work with. And even Promesa, there, Promesa, there's the library, there's something called Deferred. That's a way to work with promises in a better way when you just create a promise and then you deliver the value somewhere else. It's kind of like a synchronous uh, core sync promise chain. And Promesa have this deferred, but it will not work on the, on the JavaScript API. So there are code that you probably will see when I show you that like you I expose a promise deferred, but then I have to wrap around in a promise again, because otherwise this will not work in the interop. Also, Saturn cannot invent things because, well, I want to support the API that already exists. So we can invent a new API and start to use that. Well, we can, but not, <laughs> not before we support Atom and VS Code. And got as almost as hackable as Emacs, but probably not Lisp all the way down. I would love to do that, but well, JavaScript does not work like that. It means that also most things are actually comments. You don't like move the cursor. You can have a comment, move cursor down, and it will move the cursor. This makes things more hackable because you can like trigger the API. Atom works like that. So it's like easier to translate. Okay, so again, this is the Atom editor. So this thing here is a plugin. Let me see if I can like, yeah, this, this works better. So this is a plugin. The tree view is a plugin. We are able to reuse this. This is a plugin, the tab view. We can reuse that, but we are not going to. I'm going to show you a little bit later why. This is a plugin. It's chlorine. And this is a command palette. Then it's also a plugin. That's one of the interesting things. I can change the behavior of the command palette in the Atom. And that it's something that I already did in the past. So that's amazing that we can like have this level of flexibility by doing plugins. <laughs> so this is also a plugin, the status bar that's on the bottom side of the Atom. And if you see here, you see that there's a smart mode and CLJ working. These two are provided by different plugins. So Atom does offer a way for plugins to communicate between them, even when they don't, the, the editor itself doesn't know that a plugin exists. So that's something that I want to reuse. And how it, this works is with services. So a plugin can say that provide us some services. So the service is like a, a pair of provided and consumed. So the status bar provides a service called provide status bar in the, oh, sorry. It provides a services, the service called status bar. And this service have two different versions. One is provide status bar and the other is legacy provide status bar. So it's amazing that we can like, there's built in in the Atom editor a way to aggregate new functionality without breaking existing code. So we don't need to just uh, grow things by accretion. That's exactly how we work in Clojure. But we can keep supporting older versions if we want by offering different entry points. So that's, this is something that I really want to reuse in the Saturn. And I'm kind of reusing right now. So Saturn current implement services. Now we are finally going to the code. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> and I am using reframe. So I'm registering two different events. One is called provider register and the other is consumer register. So when I trigger that I want to register a provider, I'm saying, okay, I want this plugin to provide some kind of service to the editor. And a consumer can say, okay, I want to consume that service and use in any way that I want. This is not message passing, this is API actually. So it's callbacks. You provide a service, you inform an entry point and the entry point will be called with like things that need to be, to be done. And when you consume a service, you provide an entry point and that entry point will be called with 
the contents, the, the actual provider of that service. Let me show an example here. So this is, for example, I decided to make a test that register a provide in a consumer pair. So in this case, I'm testing the provider before the consumer. Oh, by the way, this events make frame. And, um, that's something that I want to, to share also. I'm not sure if people are familiar with, with reframe here, but reframe works by registering events globally. And I am not using reframe. I'm using free range. It's a fork of reframe made by the folks of Next Journal. And it's an amazing upgrade to reframe because you actually make the frame of the reframe local. So I can create a frame and register events outside of the global scope. And um, Mauricio, uh, if it is okay, could you say just a couple of words about what it is? Uh, because, you know, for the recording, it could be used. Oh, okay, sure. So. Thanks. Okay, so let's let's start with like the the idea of um, oh let's start to React because that's how things started. If people are familiar with React, you kind of have this state that's it's local to every component. So people decided to, to make a global state, and that didn't work because well, global state is always bad. It's hard to get right. So. Reframe is a way to make the global state more, more easily consumable. So in this case, with Reframe, you trigger events and these events update the global state and you can subscribe to these changes. So for example, <clears throat> supposing I am making a, a new UI that have a login password and I click like login and it triggers a backend environment. I could trigger um, every input box could like, when, you're in, when I am typing, it's triggering reframe saying, okay, I am updating this value of this text box. And reframe what will actually update the global state. And then I'm subscribing back to these changes. So I'm, I just am saying, okay, if I, told, if I type, for example, my username, Mauricio, I will get back Mauricio. I can also do this to make like masks, for example. Okay, I want to downcase every letter. So I trigger with what I type it in my keyboard and the, the handler will actually downcase my letters. And when I subscribe back, I will get back lowercase chars. So I can actually type uppercase chars in my login page and it would, I would just see lowercase because that's how reframe works. But this is global and free range makes this local. So I can make a frame and then I can dispatch events locally to this frame and not to the global state. And I can also subscribe to this frame and not again to the global state. And finally, reframe have the concept of effects. So for example, if I am triggering, I don't know, I click on the button login, login in my old example. <clears throat> um, if I am triggering like, like clicking login, I can update the state saying, okay, I am triggering the backend. And then I have a call effect that says actually since the update to the, to the global state, to the, to the API. And that will work. Sorry, someone else speaking something? Oh, okay. Um, well, I hope it. I hope this explains things. If not, yes, thank you so much. I just saw that Vincent's here, so maybe sometime I will like scream something. Wake up! <laughs> because it's really late for him. <laughs> okay, uh, wonderful. And okay, so back to the test. Uh, I am using a library that's called Check. It's a library that I did for other plugins. So I'm not invented this library to the, to the Atom, to the Saturn editor. 
I actually did, did say that we don't want to reinvent things just for the editor. And I am just using a library that I invented, but actually it was not for the editor. So anyway, <laughs> let's like ignore that part for now. It's just to make asynchronous tests more manageable in the ClojureScript world. So yeah, I'm actually testing by providing something before consuming it. So as you can see the provider, it's a function. It's a function that returns what I want to provide. So in this case, I am just resolving this promise called result that is here. So I'm just checking if this function was called. This is a spy, like it's stub, mock, whatever. I am just doing it by hand. And the consumer, we receive the provider and we'll do something to it. In this case, we'll just call the do function. This actually can't be done like this in the real code because, well, these things are JavaScript, so they will become uh, mangled if you use ClojureScript in your plugin, but it is just for the test, so it works. But actually, we should like expose JS objects here, otherwise this will break in the real code. Maybe I would change that just to reflect that this is how it actually should be called. And that's one of the points that's kind of hard to get it right in this editor project because, well, it is JavaScript. So sometimes I keep forgetting that I can't do that. And this is one of, was one of the examples. I can't really do that in a real code. But anyway, um, the consumer will just call the provider with the, with the keyword, it works. Again, we can't use keywords in a real plugin. So I may change this later. So I'm actually dispatching that I want to register a provider called service one that's this provider, in this case, this function. And I want to register a consumer that is this consumer, that's this function. And I want to check that the result is it works. So check the library that I did is just going to wait for the promise to be resolved and see if the result matches with it works. And if it does, then this test will pass. It actually is passing right now. So it's just to check if by registering a provider and a consumer, the consumer will be called with the provider. And actually there's a, there's a different test that registers things in the opposite order, like register the consumer first, the provider second, and it should work the same way because that's how services work. They are asynchronous. So that's one of the pain points of it, but well, they should work no matter how is the order that you're called. We can't really decide on the order. When you start your editor, you start to load plugins, so they will provide and consume services in random orders, so everything should work no matter how it's, how it's done. So this is the editor right now. It's kind of beautiful considering the time that I spent on it, but it actually kind of not works <laughs> because Nobody here is really working. Just clicking here opens the, the file in a new tab. If I click close tab, it does nothing. If I try to reorder tabs, it does nothing, but I can type on the editor, but I can save. So yeah, we it's kind of working, but we have to like increment in small steps. And I'm actually in a kind of hammock time because I want to register comments right now because I don't want to hard code that when I click here, I close the editor. I want clicking here to trigger a comment that will close the editor. So that's how I want to handle this. So if you run the editor with an environment variable tests set to anything that's not zero or empty string, it will open this docking here that, sh that should run all your tests. So that's one of the other things that I want. I showed the test here. This is the kind of level of abstraction that I want in my tests. I do not want tests that, inter that are testing internal state and everything. Even the reframe dispatch is not really what I want to do. I want to actually do something more higher level than this, because maybe we can replace reframe in the future and I don't want to break tests just by replacing uh, the way that I handle events. So that's one of the things that I, that I want. I want this kind of 
experience when I am testing inside the editor with a real working code base and not by mocking the UI, mocking the things and everything else. <clears throat> and oh, the, it, actually this is clickable. So if I click this, I can go to the line of test that it run and check it. So that's one of all the good things to have tests built in in the editor because in the future, I really want to test the, to develop Saturn in itself. Like I run the test, if it fails, I click on it. I go to the file that failed. I change inside Saturn, run again and see if it will keep failing or not. And this is the tree view from the Atom editor. So it's amazing that I could reuse almost 100% of it. And this is not the tab view from the Atom. And I'm gonna explain a little bit why. And this is the Monaco editor from the VS Code. So it's Frankenstein. <laughs> like this is Atom, the whole UI is regions, and this is like Monaco editor. <laughs> so it's Frankenstein that I'm doing, but well, it should be, be working. So, okay, the tech stack is free range for the, for the event handling. I'm using Regent for React binding. Promessa to actually handle promises. If you saw my list, latest post about Clojure Script, I do not really like Cori Sync for, for a synchronous handling in Clojure Script. They, Cori Sync works really well in Clojure, but not really in Clojure Script in my experience. So Promessa is better for this specific situation. Electron from the UI, but that's one of the other things that happened. I was talking with a friend and I, we decided to do this, this proof of concept that's React Blessed. I don't know if you are familiar with any curses library, but any curses is a library that makes UIs or well, text UIs. So you use text interface with like, some better handling of how the terminal resizes and everything. There's a version of curses called Blessed for Node.js. And there's something that's called React Blessed. It's a React layer over this curses fork. So we decided to try and it kind of works. So we can have the Saturn editor in terminal mode. Well, some plugins will not work because they would expect like UIs happening, but maybe plugins that do not really need like UI elements will work. And that could be actually something really, really good because remember, I want to support the VS Code API. The VS Code API is incredibly limiting on what you can do in your user interface. So if it's limiting what I can do in the user interface, I can just implement these things that I can do in Blessed, in the text mode, and then plugins in VS Code should work on a text-based editor. That should be amazing. And I'm using Mali for schemas. I actually found some bugs with the way that they are instrumenting code with it. But well, the, it's a great library, it's fast and people are really, really helpful in solving problems with this library. So I'm actually changing my ways of using just um, prismatic schema to just use Molly because it works better. And I actually want to use Molly because, well, it's a big project. So I want to instrument some functions to be sure that I'm not passing elements that I do not, for example, nullable elements or non-nullable elements should be handled by Molly if I could. And well, this is the UI. So as you can see, it's really simple. There's support for theme already built in because I, again, cannibalized some parts of the Atom. So themes are working right now. And I can change themes. There's just not an API for that, for that yet, but I can do by triggering reframe events and they will update the theme. And this is the, if I can run tests, just add the tests UI. Otherwise, just add the editor UI. And the editor, it's actually incredibly simple because I'm reusing Monaco. So I am just like 
getting the element of the NEFT docking. And I am actually doing this atom panel container to do something else, but that's the trivial. It's hard coded for now. I do not want it to be, but I, for now it is. And this is the layout React. It's a library that's, in, that's a core library from the Saturn editor that handles the layout. And this is the layout component. This is something that I, I was thinking. I could reuse the frame from the free range that's on the Saturn editor, but I cannot do that because this is a plugin. So supposedly it should not have access to the Saturn state. It should have access only to, to his own local state. So that's where free range came really handy because I can make a new frame just for the layout component. And then everything here is specifically to the to layout component. Well, it's a car component. Supposedly I could use the global state, but I do not want to, because again, I want this to be possible to be developed in parallel with the editor. So maybe if I want to extract this to a real plugin someday later, I could do that. And I'm gonna show this code later if you want, but it's a lot to, to handle that. I do not really want just to be four splits in the screen, but for now it is what it is. Otherwise I would not go anywhere. I wanted to do like the, the VIM and Emacs split when you can split anywhere in any way you can, but well, it will just not happen at this time. <laughs> It's just too much, too much code for now. And well, I decided to call plugins rings because it, it sounded right for the Saturn. <laughs> so we have rings that provide um, the layout and consume what I call the presentable. And I'm gonna show it a little bit in what this is. And yeah, and the element is actually just a React or in this case, a Regent element is reusing the Atom Pane, not really. It's just a div that have the name Atom, Atom Pane. But I just did that because I can reuse themes from the Atom, so anyway. And this will append the presentable into the UI. The presentable, it's something that can be shown on the screen, that's all. So the layout component does not know what is being presented on the screen. In this case, it can be a text editor or it can be, I don't know, some plugin or anything else. So that's one of the things that I will also want to support is that, yeah, layout handles the layouting of anything in the screen, but it doesn't matter what it is. It just will handle that correctly. And the provider is just like open or get react as an element. It should also support get element, but that's, for the future reference. And well, again, look at this R as element. This is using the region component to translate a uh, region into a React element. I cannot use, cannot really, really use region because again, this is a plugin. So it will become JavaScript and then the concept of vectors and lists and keywords will become meaningless when you convert between back and forth. Okay, so what I was able to reuse, I was able to reuse the doc element, that's something that layouts things on the screen, the tree view, the style component to make the, um, the themes and the editor elements. That's from Monaco, in this case, uh, it's from the VS Code, not from the Atom. I'm re-implementing tabs because the Atom tabs plugin expect too much internal state. It, it actually expects a little bit more. It also wants to install binary packages so we can listen to when a file changes outside of the editor so we can change the color of the tab by hand. So I do not want to support that for now or maybe ever. I want to support something that's more like clean. When you, a plugin can just be like more clean. And why is that? Because I can, this editor in the future for the web page. If I just implement the plugins that people, that the 
if I can just re-implement things that the core components expect in the, in the web page. Yeah, maybe it would not work that well because it's asynchronous, but well, reframe is already sync, so it's not really redoing anything. And of course, inspiring works, Emacs, Neovim, Atom, Lighttable, Code Bubbles, and lots of others. Code Mirror is here, Monaco is also here. But especially Emacs, it's something that really inspired on how they were able to go so far with a code base that was written, I don't know, 50 years ago almost. And we actually want Saturn to be as hackable as Emacs if possible. Maybe not that hackable, but the most that we can go to. And Emacs can break if you do wrong things. And the idea of a hackable text editor is exactly the same. I can break if I do uh, weird things. There's something that I also want to support in Atom, in Saturn, that is reloadable configs. No editor actually do that when you like change your config or change your init script and it just reloads everything. This does not work in any, in any editor that I want, that I know of. I know that Emacs have some limited support that you can like manually disable and enable things. I think Atom also do that, but you have to be aware that you are disabling and enabling because by default, everything is global. And I really want, if possible, the Saturn learn from this, this steps and like kind of exposes a public API that you can just reload everything by scratch. Like, okay, I save this initial file, it will just destroy everything that I did in the old init file and start a new one and everything should work correctly. So that's something that I want to experiment in the future. And for now, that's it. If you want to see more, I do have the, the Atom package, the, the Saturn package here. Let me stop the sharing. If I can't find where I do I stop the sharing. Well, well, actually, I don't know what happened with my Zoom, but I cannot stop sharing things. I'll try to do it. Oh, it you have. Okay. Amazing. Beautiful. Thank you so much for this, Maurizio. And hello, uh, Isabella. Hello, Vincent. Wonderful. You have joined us. And on this very late hour on Vincent's side, at least. Um, yeah. So uh, should we think, I guess we will keep recording for a while and, uh, and afterwards we'll stop recording at some point. Um, let us think how we could dive in further, right? Uh, are there any questions to Maurizio? Okay, please, one. Um, <laughs> what do you think the changes actually are that this is going to evolve into something that's really usable and not just, well, an interesting experiment? Because like, it seems like there's a lot of work to get it into more than a prototype. Yeah, uh, there is a lot of work. And actually, I don't know how to answer your question. I wanted to, I want to redo the experience that Atom left with me. Like, well, let me, I, I think it's better that if I, if I try to explain it with more than feelings than like concrete examples, because well, that's how it happened. When I first learned about Lighttable, I thought, oh, that is amazing. But then I saw that Lighttable was really limited, not because the editor itself was limited, but because there was no plugin for Lighttable. So for example, when I tried to use Clojure with it, there was not a single implementation of Parin for that work. So I did try to make one and failed. But well, it works for 80% of the, the, the cases. Some cases, the perimeter of front light table just think, do things weirdly. And there's a specific case that it locks the editor. <laughs> so I don't recommend anyone to use. And I try to migrate to Atom. And 
when I saw Atom at the first time, I was okay, this sounds interesting. It's a slow as hell. It consumes a lot of memory, but I tried to do a plugin. It was a simple plugin that if I had a Tmux opened, I could send comments to it. And it was incredibly easy to do that. It was like surprisingly easy. And I was like, okay, the, we may have something here because I did try to make plugins for the VIM editor in the past and it's hard, really, really hard. And it still is with, even with new, new VIM. So I got into this like feeling of the editor is mine. I can do, I can make it work the way that I want to do. So actually today, for example, my Atom editor is incredibly customizable. I have ligatures turned on, but I do not like to type when there are ligatures in the code because they kind of mess up the spacing on everything. So my Atom editor currently, when I have ligatures turned on and I am at the same line, for example, when the cursor is at a specific line, it will just disable ligatures, but only for that line, everything else keeps ligatures on. So this is a kind of flexibility that I don't have in any other editor as of now. Maybe Emacs have, but well, Atom does have this kind of flexibility. And it's not like CSS, HTML, JavaScript. It's not like, uh, I don't know, Vim, Vim script or something that only works in a specific editor, like for example, the Elisp that it's on Emacs. Not, there's a, not that there is a problem with Elisp. It, actually, it doesn't have a problem, but uh, there are more packages for Node, for JavaScript, for better, for worse than there are for other languages. And so it would, should be useful to just use something that's more mainstream and not something that's only used for that specific editor, for example, Vim, Script, or Elisp. And that was the experience that I had with Atom. And then I tried to migrate to VS Code. And one of the things that VS Code forbids me is to change the UI in any way. So that's kind of a bummer because I changed the UI in lots of different ways <laughs> in Atom. And VS Code do that to protect me from breaking my editor. And I kind of understand because it's a product, they want to be viable, but I, it sounds that the editor is not mine. The editor is from someone else and I can use that the way that they want me to use. And I want an editor that I can use the way that I want to use. And that's one of the reasons why I understand why people choose Emacs because Emacs is the, like the topmost, in my opinion, of I use the editor the way that I want to use. If you had two power Emacs users with different, trying to use the Emacs from one of the other, they will not be able to use because like this person have an Emacs that's completely configurable for him. And this other has a completely different Emacs with other configs. And that's the, exper the experience, if possible, that I want to do in, in the Saturn editor. So yeah, it is a lot of work, but I think it's doable if I can keep like scrapping fragments of other editors. For example, let me just get some statistics. Oh, actually, I'm going to share my screen. If something is... I am screen sharing. Let me just see if I am screen sharing the right screen. Um, do you see the Atom editor here? With no, this? we see the background with this oh, wallpaper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm sharing the different test. Oh, yeah. We saw the browser history. I'm sorry about that one. Yeah. No, it's actually on uh, the. I have three different desktops, and maybe now you see the Atom editor, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm gonna change the the font size here a little bit because it's. Okay, so currently this is how Atom works for me. Like I have this ligature turned on 
and I turn off if I am a specific line. If I am in VIM insert mode, all ligatures are disabled by default. So this is what I meant with like the, the idea of the, the editor. And this is the Saturn editor. It's actually little code. Yeah, this is not needed anymore. So this is the themes plugin. So it's literally 23 lines of code because I'm reusing most of the Atom parts. And let me see the, um, let me see the, the, the core package. I think it's the view. Yeah, this is the core package. It's like, again, little code, not really that much to be seen here, but I am reusing like the doc from the Atom editor. It's this, Wait, what is this? Yeah, it's done the widgets namespace. Yeah, that's done the JavaScript dependencies docs. So I am reusing the doc component from the Atom. And again, it's just a thin layer over what doc does. It's actually most like wrap inside the React render and not really that, that much code. And some like triggerings and settings of internal state from the docking because, well, we don't have the full API of Atom implemented yet. So I kind of need to do that. And yeah, tabs also is really, really small, but this will grow because it's not done yet. The tests, it's how to how I render tests inside the Atom, inside the Saturn editor. So again, it's way less code than I, I see in other editors. So that's one of the things I want this experience to be like less dense than other editors. So let me see if I can count lines here. Okay, so this is the total number of lines that I have in the Atom, in the Saturn editor, including tests to make this kind of UI. You can see the, the Saturn UI, right? Okay, so let, let me see here. Yeah, so this is like the user interface that's on, on Saturn. This docking here is reusable, reused from Atom. So, it actually has something, some interesting things like resizable elements and so on and so forth. The tab is working and I can click here, but nothing happens because again, as I told, I did not implement this yet, but I can edit code and it kind of have a built-in autocomplete from the, from the Monaco editor. So the project is way more code cool than I would like to be, but it's doable because I am like trying to reuse most of the code that I that I could. There are parts of code that I would not be able to export. For example, the, I think in source, yeah, source there's Saturn and the JavaScript dependencies is basically something that I copy pasted from the Atom editor. This editor here will not be used, so I can just remove that in the future because, well, I try to reuse the Atom editor itself inside the Saturn project. It did not work well. And I'm actually, I think, at the Electron 17 here. Let me just see. Yeah, Electron 17. So I am in a fairly new Electron version. So again, it's doable because again, I'm reusing most of the things that I can. So I'm not like, I don't have the problem of upgrading Electrum. Probably if I bump Electrum to the latest version, it will just work. Yeah, what I, I think like the hard part is gonna be to get the plugin system running, right? Because the, the, the left side is, well, I mean, it's just a file 
browser thing. The rest, the right side is just letting Monaco show the contents of the file. You don't really need to do anything for that. Um, you get that kind of for free. And like the interesting part is getting Atom or VS Code plugins to work. And probably even more interesting is to be able to have the VS Code API um, be more extensible than it is currently. Because like, I don't know, I think like most of us are kind of okay-ish happy with VS Code uh, the way it is. And we wouldn't need a big new project, whatever. Um, a VS Code would just let us do the things that it actually can do and didn't just put walls in front of us that are kind of artificial sometimes where it's like, yeah, you're allowed to put some markdown element in here, but you're not allowed to show a picture or something sometimes. Um, so like the VS Code API is like, is that artificially blocking you from it destroying things, even if you actually know what you're doing, which is like very strange. Yeah, but actually this, this tree view here, it calls Atom comments. So I am already implementing parts of the Atom API to make the tree view work. So that's one of the things that I would like also to share. There's here, I think it's on adapter Atom. Well, it's a proxy thing here that like, just spies on every specific part of the Atom editor because, well, I do not want to implement this all at once. And all of this code here, most of this is a stub, as you can see. But if you look at this, I just implemented what it was needed from the tree view to work. And actually, the only need that was really, really needed is this workspace. And workspace needs this one. That's the open element. So right now it is already dispatching to a new reframe component that opens the editor and it uses all the machinery that I did explain. And that's one of the amazing things because the machinery is different from what, what Atom expects. What I am currently doing in Atom actually, what it will happen is I would open the, would trigger an open, it will open a text editor and it will put into the, the center panel by default. And what is actually doing right now, I am asking for the layout component to lay out this URI. And this is, in this case, it's a file, it's a file component, but it could be anything. And when the layout component receives that, he will search into its, tail, into its tabs and see if that component, that presentable URI already exists. And if it does, it will just focus that element. So for example, I do have here, git ignore, it's already open. So it just focuses it. If I try depth hidden, it's just focusing it. It's not opening a new one, but index HTML, it opens a new one because it did not exist in the stack yet. So this is plugin only. The plugin decided to do that. It's not something that, well, I decided because I made a plugin, but if, I don't know, there was another plugin here that would just, I don't know, decide that, okay, every, every moment that you click on something, it will not, focus, it will just open and open and open over again, or it will open in a split or whatever. The plugin decides how it opens and if it opens. So this is already using the, the Saturn machinery. It's sending to the, to the layout. The layout is a consumer of the presentable. So it asks, okay, do I have this, this presentable already in the UI? If I do, just focus. If I do not, then call the presentable component and asks to open a new presentable for this URI, and then it presents on the on the UI. So yes, 
I still need to work on lots of API components. As you can see, most of the things are stubs. How large is the uh, the surface area of the Atom API? Like I know the, the VS Code one is huge, um, but it's mostly huge because well, you've got calls for every little bit, just so they can like differentiate calls and put different walls in front of you. Um, I don't know how large the VS Code uh, the Atom one is. Atom is also huge, but I actually don't think. I should be able to, I, I don't think I would be able to implement all the API. What I really wanted, if possible, was to implement most of the API that makes, I don't know, 80% of the plugins work. Atom API have lots of things like, okay, so get this tab and get the component that's inside of this tab and get the HTML that's inside this component and so on and so forth. I don't think we do need all of this kind of, of um, specific thing because first, these APIs are hard to use. I tried to use them in the past and it's actually better to register what Atom calls, I think it's uh, OpenAble or something like this. So you register something that has been able to open something in the editor and Atom will open it for you and decide where to put it. It's faster and it's easier to do that. So what I want mostly is to implement that API. And I think, I don't know, 50% of the plugins that open things in the UI will work with that. So maybe other the other 50% will not be able to do anything, but honestly, the Atom API is not that, that usable because it's, lots of internal things and internal states and everything. And also there are specific APIs that are only used for syntax highlighting and they will probably not be implemented because we are using Monaco right now. In fact, Atom do, does have an API for semantic highlighting, kinda. It, they never did document that anywhere. So <laughs> I would not implement this one. And most plugins that I tried to use semantic highlighting do not work today because they changed the API that was internal and everything broke. So yeah, probably not a problem. But that's something that I, that's why I also call this presentation an attempt to make the editor because I want to be able to run Chlorine, maybe Calva, Parinfer, Paridit, on Saturn. If I could do that, I would like consider a small success. And then I can see if I can run, I don't know, JavaScript plugins or linters and everything else. I think this covers, if, if I can run LSP, and I think I can because Monaco already have all of these things built in. I think, I don't know, maybe six to 70% of the cases are covered. Maybe. Yeah, getting uh, the LSP to run in Monaco isn't that hard. You just basically just run it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like exactly. Or something. But, uh, you don't get like the full power of it because like there's stuff missing inside Monaco that's uh, built into VS Code and not into Monaco, but you get a lot of it. Yeah, so that's actually one of the things that I really want to explore. How far can we? go with little code. And if the answer is quite far, I would be happy. But again, if I, I don't know, have to re-implement almost all of Atom from scratch, then this, pro this project will probably be doomed to fail. <laughs> so I'm not yet sure how far it will go, but that's also one of the reasons that I am making this, this presentation right now, to see if people are interested. Have you already tried to run it as a web page thing? Uh, Is there anything killing it from just like running it right now? No, there's nothing killing it. I think I have no, let me just, let me just check, but I think I don't have any. Node libraries. Node libraries that are, I don't know. 
Yeah, probably not. I mean, it this has one plus maybe uh, if that's like a file system thing. But who knows? Yeah, but that is, I think, use it only for the tree view. So mm. we can just, I don't know, re-implement this. Have and a tree view. <laughs> not have a tree view exactly. Also, there's something that I want to show, but I forgot to show. Atom does have this kind of path watcher here. And oh yeah, this these yeah, are the, the not gonna work, yeah. Yeah, so path watcher, it's currently implemented as a shim. So it's here. Let me show. So it currently does nothing. Mm. But the thing is, we can one of the thing, one of the ideas of the Saturn editor is the core will implement all the binary packages. So supposedly, if you want to run in a web page, we can have a core Saturn that's basically something that runs locally, and then it talks with the web page with web sockets, and that should work. Yeah, plus a path watcher doesn't really make any sense in a browser anyway. Yeah, I don't know where the file change would come from if it's not from you inside the browser. Well, there's all there's always the I think index at db and this bizarre things that happen in browser land, right? That's true. If something else changed the index db where the files are that you're yeah, yeah. Although, should work. File watching on index db, I don't know if that works. Yeah, I'd have I... to check the API. But like those are like like you said, those are small things that are not that important to the whole thing. If we didn't ever have any file watchers or something, uh, it wouldn't be a bad yeah, I experience. I think this FS admin, it's I don't I am not sure, even sure if it's still use it. I think this three were used by the Atom text editor. I'm not sure if I remove them if it will keep working. But anyway, the trivia is using them. So if we want, we can just like get rid of the trivia and everything will work. Or we can implement a new trivia that did not use this, this elements. And that's the beauty of it, right? I mean, we can just yeah, throw away yeah. the plugin. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see here. There's a trivia. It's all good. We don't have to do it right now. It's just uh, I was wondering if there was anything major that uh, that would prevent it from uh, running in a browser right now um, that would have to be solved, or if it's just like yeah, of course we we have to touch the file system at some point um, if we are not in a browser and in the browser we don't need it. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's on the trivia that's using FS plus, but we can do a shim. We can do a shim here. Mm -hmm. Like just look from the FS. It's mostly exist sync, is directory sync. Well, the problem is the sync, right? <laughs> sync is not good. Yeah. If it was a synchronous, then everything would work beautifully. Oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> that's one of the things that I don't like of the atom, and that's why I Try to, I tried like more time than I wanted to make Atom work with like current code. It's that Atom does implement lots of things in lots of different places. Like the file system, this library, it's used in the tree view, it's used on the tab view, and it's used on the text editor itself. So you don't really have in the Atom a service that just streams between plugins you have this code duplicated everywhere so it gets hard when you want to run in a browser or in a specific environment yeah makes sense yeah but oh, i mean we can just do a shim for this 26 specific things here and just remove all faults for all of them and should it work that's a good experiment, Lucas. I will try that. Okay.
by the way, we have about 10 minutes to the official time. And maybe at some point we like to stop the recording and maybe keep chatting if you wish. And um, um, so Maurizio, maybe you would like to think if you wish to say something to conclude about how people could help with the project, about where you would like people to discuss this uh, and so on. Yeah, I actually am thinking about opening a Slack channel and a Zelep channel called Saturn. So we can discuss there if people are interested. As I told, this project is still in like hammock time. I want this to be usable, but I also do not want to rush things. I mean, in the first version, I decided that uh, layouts should be completely flexible. And I tried to implement that and it didn't work because I thought, okay, I am spending too much time thinking on how this should work instead of just doing a first version. So in the end, I decided, okay, why I don't create a plugin that's called layout? And then I delegate this to the future Mauricio. Okay, Mauricio from the future, right now you can decide how do you want to split things. Mauricio from the present, you just have fixed elements and that's all. And that worked. And actually I think it was a more elegant solution than what I was initially thought that would just like allow to lay out anything in any place. So I do not want to rush things. So that's why the project is going slowly. The, the next big step is add comments and they are the atom comments. I do not really want to tie that atom comments are the authoritative way of doing things. But I also don't want to expose reframe. Not only I don't want, but also I can't expose reframe to plugins because, well, it will not work. It's simply like that. It will be wonderful if I could, but I cannot because it's not, it's not how Clojure script works when you compile with JavaScript. So that's, that's the next big step to see how will I handle comments. And when I decide to do that, I want to like generate some comments like the save file and the close file to at least be able to edit files in the editor and have it being saved. And then I want to start to think on other things like watching file system changes and everything. So yeah, it's a lot of work yet to be done, but I want to like make a call for arms. If people want to discuss or have any ideas or anything, especially focusing on simplicity on how I can make this with less code possible and like have something fast as possible. I would love to like discuss ideas and then implement. I am accepting pull requests. Maybe I do not have time to review all of them as of now, but if we I don't know, make a group, maybe people can help on that. And yeah, that's, that's it, I think. Nothing really. I know that I do not have, I, I would love it if I could like show here, oh, this is the Saturn editor. Let's connect to a socket repo. Let's connect Calva to it. I would love to do that, but it's not there yet. And I really hope one day it could be there, even if it like works with less performance than VS Code. But I think we can make use of a better and more hackable text editor. I do not want to see VS Code like getting all the, 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 the love from the developers. And then we'll have like this kind of weird, weird division of, well, I am a Mimax user, I am a VIM user, or I am a VS Code user. I think this division is like quite bad. I mean, I do not familiarize myself with Emacs. I would love to, because it seems that it's a wonderful piece of tooling that everyone likes to use all the time. But I, I don't feel myself comfortable working with Emacs. And while I do feel comfortable working with Atom, we have to be realistic. It's not, it's not going to continue in the, in the most following years, probably. I mean, they shut down all the forums and there's an issue that's already been solved like for months, maybe years, that people are just not reviewing pull requests anymore. 
So yeah, I do not want to see the idea of a modern hackable text editor dying so fast. And also I do not like that only we in Clojure land have, uh, are going to get these benefits. I mean, there is like people in the small talk world that are doing wonderful things. And we in the closure world are trying to like put editors and put uh, visualizers inside our code bases so we can inspect things. And it's wonderful, but it only works for closure. I would like to like, I don't know, do that, but also sometimes edit an HTML file and have the same experience if possible. So yeah, that's, that's all that I really want to do, that this call for arms and let's discuss it more. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is it okay to ask more? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you you mentioned Emacs, and and you know I'm I'm thinking about the experience of extensibility. What a user who doesn't know so much can do to extend the right. editor, and then in Emacs. You can do little things. You can add a function. You can add a variable, a key binding, a hook, and you just write a little bit of code and you can add those things. And whenever you do that, it is all discoverable, right? So you can ask for documentation of a key binding, a function, and so on. And so you have those little things that can all be added and can affect the runtime in a mutable, risky way. And that is how it is. And they don't need to know so much about, um, you know, web development or, and such, just a little bit of Emacs list. So yeah, I, I'm wondering how it compares to your vision of, of the user experience of extending that. I think that, um... Atom does almost the same thing. You can open an init script and just add variables, add key bindings. It's not as discover discoverable and not as introspective because again, it makes it, it's kind of a list machine, right? It's list all the way down. Like the core Emacs knows what's happening in the ELISP because the core Emacs is kind of interpreter of ELISP. So it knows what's happening. In the Atom editor, it's not as discoverable, discoverable because the Atom is not implementing JavaScript. The Electron runtime is, in, is interpreting the JavaScript and pre-compile with JIT and everything. And then the Atom is just like running the, in the same VM. Maybe on Saturn, we can expose an SCI. That's one of the things that I really want to, to try. I do not think that init scripts should be portable between Atom VS Code and, well, init scripts don't exist in VS Code except for Joyride. So maybe use Joyride as an inspiration for, for the Saturn editor. But maybe we can have an, a close experience in the Saturn by using SCI. So you write a fragment of Clojure script in the SCI, name it, <clears throat> this SCI flavored Clojure script. And it's discoverable, it's hot reloadable, and people can know like, okay, this is failing because there's some beautiful stack trace that SCI offers you. They say, okay, this is failing because of this and this and that. So this is possible. It's not the focus on the editor right now because I want it to be usable, then I want to be friendly. I want actually to be more friendly to be hackable. Like, clone the, the, the Saturn repository and starts hacking right away if you want something new. Because it's a few person, actually right now it's a one person project. Maybe two, because there's a friend that did uh, the pull request for the React Blessed version. So it's a really big project to handle alone. So I, want, I do not want to put a barrier for people that say, okay, I want to add something. There's an API on Atom that I want to support. How can I do that? I want to be able to say, okay, clone the repo, run the script, and you're, you're good to go. 
just start hacking, nothing else. That's one of the things that uh, one of the, the experience that I'm focusing as of now, but in the future, I want to be able to also be user friendly, like have a tree view, people can click, people can use as a maybe slower VS code, but as friendly as VS code is. And when they want the extra power, then can jump right in and start hacking. Again, maybe we can't have the same experience on Linux because Emacs is amazing for that. It's, I think, one of the most hackable pieces of software that we have. But I do got a huge experience on Atom. I mean, I can't do lots of things in Atom Editor. I remember once I put the notifications of Linux inside the Atom Editor because I was missing like meetings and everything. So I was typing and then I would get an Atom notification like, okay, you have a meeting in three minutes that was listening to libnotify from Linux. So it's doable with a needed script. It was not a plugin, it's just a needed script that I did. And I, again, it's doable, we can extend, it's discoverable. So this experience, it's exactly the same as Emacs, but in a visual way, like graphical user interface way, let's say something like this, and not only a text and text based with some graphical elements that Emacs have today. I think that's one of the, the, the things that are the, the experience that I want people to, to have, to not only have the hackable editor that you can change, but a hackable and also friendly editor for newcomers. And usually people say that Emacs is not that user unfriendly and I cannot disagree more. <laughs> I never got the hang of Emacs and I really, really think that maybe, I don't know, if there were better tutorials for Emacs, this could be doable, this could be solved in, a, in some way. But it's good to have, to have like an alternative, right? Currently we have Emacs and VIM, they all compete in the same manner of the Hackable Text Editor. I'm not sure if I'm making sense here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's kind of like having Chrome and having Firefox. Like Firefox is a buggier version than Chrome, but it's good to have concurrent a concurrent version of of like a browser. Otherwise, Chrome will just eat the web. But well, it's already eating the web, deciding on new new ways of how JavaScript should work and everything. But it was from Firefox, if I'm not mistaken, from Mozilla Labs that was came to be. So maybe if we did not have Firefox, we would not have like WebAssembly right now. And WebAssembly is kind of amazing. So yeah, that's that's the idea, I think. Yeah. Mm. By the way, are you thinking about about uh, the use case of a remote file system and remote runtime for for closure, for example? Well, when you're building it, are you having this in mind? Because I guess those things are the things that could matter when you're trying to build a modular system. Yeah, I'm actually trying to think on this <clears throat> for the remote file system. I think it's mostly a matter of registering a different provider for the presentable. So for example, instead of like, I want to provide this file on this local machine, I could register a provider that says, okay, I want to provide this file from the local, to, from the global file system, and then it would just do the same thing, but pipe through something else. Maybe, and I almost sure, I will have to do some kind of reordering of the plugin system because currently I have what I call the presentable provider. That's something that presents something. And I don't know what the something is. I'm thinking now about changing that to be a presentable provider from a text editor 
And then I have another thing that adds a file provider that provides a file. So the editor can be completely independent of where the file is. So it's doable if I reorder the, the elements. But I mean, it's one of the things I'm, one of the hard parts is how do I watch for changes in this remote file systems? And if possible, I want to support that too. I do not know if there's an answer for that, maybe with polling or anything else, but the file watcher is already thought about being a plugin that's separate from everything. Exceptionally because, exceptionally because currently in the Atom implementation, if three, four different plugins ask to watch the same file, I'm going to create a notifier multiple times for this file. And I do not want that. I actually want the Saturn to concentrate all the, the watchers because this can lead to bugs. And it actually does lead to bugs like too much files opened in, or too much sockets open in Linux and Mac. So you have to like keep changing the global thing that's on the Linux kernel and people get scared by doing that. I actually remember that I got scared the first time that I saw the error and the solution to that. So yeah, I, I kind of want to concentrate all of this in the Saturn. So when someone asks, I want to not to watch a file, Saturn itself will capture that, that request and say, okay, do I have a watcher for this file already done? If I do, I just had a callback. So when something happens, instead of notifying this one person or this one plugin, I will notify this three plugins and that's so. So this should work to alleviate the problems and also will work with remote files because it's a plugin. I can just put a new plugin that watches from remote files and things hopefully will work correctly. So yeah, I am thinking about that also because it's one of the pain points of Atom. You can't work really well with remote files. And I believe it's one of the main frustration point, points for people that are moving away from it because VS Code actually does this really well. And people like the flexibility of doing that in VS Code. I'm not sure because I am not, and I'm not a VS Code user actually. I'm still using Atom as you can see. <laughs> Yeah, uh, personally, I sometimes use VS Code just for this reason. Yeah, actually using Atom is kind of like when you have a friend that was bitten by a zombie and you're kind of like trying to keep it away from you, but you still like your friend. So sometimes he's like, oh, guy, I'm sorry that I'm like this. I would say, okay. No worries, you're still my friend. And from time to time, he's like brains, you know, no, no, now you stay away from me. It's like that. I still like the editor, I still use it, but I can, I need to be aware that it's slowing down and rotting and I'm kind of like, okay, this will probably not work. This bug will always happens when I try to copy this file and I still am in VIM mode, for example. So yeah, that's also one of the reasons. <laughs> It's also a personal gain that to see if I can reuse parts of the editor that I love, but to do something that it actually will not die if, I don't know, Microsoft decides to stop the project altogether, which probably they will. Is it a perfect way to end the recording? Okay, wonderful. Any comment, Vincent? Uh... Um, I, I am thinking, uh, I would imagine that in a modular uh, program, people would use or tend to use a way of uh, declaratively say, here is an action, here is something. Uh, is there some places in, in uh, Saturn where you are using some form of uh, declaration? Well, Atom does have the, the concept of comments that you can register. So you can say, okay, here's a comment that I want to register to the, to the project. 
and you can like use from the inside of the editor and plugins can call comments from other plugins and everything. Or you can use this provider consumer thing that it's also, again, also a way to do the intercommunication of programs. I am thinking about exposing reframe or whatever I will use in the future to the plugin authors so they can like register new events or subscribe to changes in the UI or subscribe to other events that happen on the Saturn side, on the Saturn core. So for example, if I open a file, I could have like some kind of subscriber that says, okay, how many files do I have open right now? And show it in the, I don't know, a pop-up or something. It actually, it's not that simple because it's complicated to keep an editor like that because everything starts to become public API, right? It's like, there's a, I think there's a comic in the XKCD site that says the people that, that are in the Emacs user group saying, okay, the computer will not overheat anymore if you press and hold uh, white space. And one of the persons say, this breaks my workflow. I do have a sensor to see, to see that my CPU is, is overheating. <laughs> And it's something like that. I mean, I do not want to expose everything because I also want to be less dense to develop. If I want to keep all the design decisions that we did in the first, I don't know, three months of the project, then I, it will be really hard to keep the project. And actually, I think it's one of the things that, that kill Atom because they do use lots of internal states in most plugins that they they have as core plugins. So they can't really remove that element from the, from the text editor, for example, and do a better design system. Otherwise they will break like five packages. And that's horrible, honestly, <laughs> because I try to create a facade. My first try to implement this editor was put Monaco in place of the Atom editor and make a facade for all the APIs to Atom to be redirected to Monaco. And that did not work because, well, there are lots of internal state that plugins expect. So everything was like, okay, I can't call this, I can't call that, I can't call that. And I was like, okay, what's happening? I'm not doing anything. And it was actually an external plugin that supposed to render the editor in some place of the, the UI that wanted a static element defined in the editor. And Monaco does not have that because it's synchronous. So it simply did not work. And I decided, okay, it, it's not worth trying to do that. And I probably think that Emacs can have this problem also because it's list all the way down. You can change anything anywhere in any place. But it, again, it's better for debugging, but I, I mean, the idea of Atom is to be less dense than other editors, less, more easily hackable or developable, not hackable, more easily, I don't know if there's a word for that, but it, it should be like easy to develop. You just clone the repo, starts coding and everything should work. And you can change things. If the tests don't break, you can ship it as a, fin as a final product. And I do not want to like pull the 100 most used plugins into the CI to see if the Saturn is still working with them. I want the test to guarantee that. And if there's a misbehaved plugin, well, I'm sorry, the misbehaved plugin is at fault, not my editor. Okay, thank you. But yeah, that I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I mean, I do like the idea of being hackable up to this point, but I also want to be realistic that it's a few person project. It's not really feasible to work with that level of, of I don't know, of, deta of detail on the core of the, the plugin. Emacs can do that because they have people working actively on the 
Actually, that's that's one of the points that I have to give for Emacs users. If there's something that's troubling in Emacs, they kind of try to debug down to the editor level. Nobody tries to do that in any other editors, not even VIM. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank you for staying here.